Well, hello and welcome back to our study of the Psalms. I'm glad you joined me. We are in Psalm chapter 7 today. And Psalm 7 begins with the description of the Psalm and the mention of a person named Cush. We're not really sure who this is. In fact, this is the only reference of this person in all of Scripture. Now, there is a descendant of Noah's son, Ham, named Cush, but this is not the same person. And so David doesn't give us all the details, but he does give us enough to make an educated guess on what's going on as this psalm opens. We're told that Cush is from the tribe of Benjamin. So if we had to guess, we don't have to, but we might as well, right? Uh, if we had to guess, Cush was probably a follower of King Saul, the first king of Israel who also was from the tribe of Benjamin. Now we know that God rejected Saul for his disobedience and gave David the kingdom in his place. But Saul and David had many run-ins and encounters before Saul was ultimately killed in battle and David officially took the throne of Israel. And so as you look at these early verses of the psalm, it becomes clear that Cush is accusing David of some kind of wrongdoing in his dealings with King Saul. Let's read the first five verses together to get a better feel about what's going on here. Psalm chapter 7, a Shigion of David, which he sang to the Lord concerning the words of Cush, a Benjamite. Verse 1, O Lord my God, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me, lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rending it in pieces with none to deliver. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it, and let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. Say la. In these verses, David proclaims his innocence, doesn't he? And he asks for God's protection against those false accusations and the opposition of people like Cush. But there's a whole lot more in this psalm. Let's go back to the text now. Let's read the rest of Psalm chapter 7, and then we'll make a few observations when we finish doing that. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me, you have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Over it return on high. The Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and act and according to the integrity that is in me. O let the evil of the wicked come to an end and may you establish the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts. O righteous God, my shield is with God who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High. Uh, great words from David as he wraps up the psalm there in chapter 7. David is imploring God to move on his behalf. And, and there is a different thought here, uh, obviously, than what we saw in Psalm chapter 6. Here, David is appealing to God's justice. If you remember back to Psalm 6, David didn't want God's justice. He appealed to what? God's unfailing love, right? But not here. David knows in this instance he has done nothing wrong. He's done nothing worthy of this accusation, and he's done nothing worthy of the opposition from Cush and others like him. Have you ever been wrongly accused of something? I know I have. And it's always a disturbing thing when it happens, especially when what you have been accused of is so far from your character and who you are that it's somewhat laughable, except it isn't laughable, is it? And I've really struggled with this. How am I supposed to respond to false accusations? Uh, what are we supposed to do when it happens to us? And I think David gives us some insights and he gives us a good answer here in verse 9. He says, uh, to the end, the evil of the wicked... He says to end the evil of the wicked. He asks God to be the one who puts a stop to what's going on. 
It is out of his control and it's out of his power. And then he says something else. For you, Lord, look deep within the mind and heart, O righteous God. It sounds a lot like what God said to Samuel about David when he was appointed king, doesn't it? Samuel thought Jesse's oldest son was the next king. He looked the part, but God told him that he doesn't see like everyone else sees. Instead, God looks at the heart. God knows the situation. God knows what has happened. And so he's calling us to trust him with all of it. In Romans chapter 12, we're reminded that as much as depends on us, we are to live at peace with everyone. And sometimes you can do all that you can and it still doesn't get better. Sometimes you can do everything in your power and, and it just gets worse. And so David says, do what you can and leave the rest to God. And while you do, remember, as verse 10 says, that God is your shield. God is the one who will lift us up if we humble ourselves and leave the justice to him. Next, David has some very descriptive words as he begins to draw the psalm to a close. He says that the unrepentant will find themselves on the other end of God's flaming arrows. He says the wicked with all their lies and trouble ultimately are digging a pit for themselves that they're going to fall into. What was meant for him, he says, is going to fall back on them. Now, in our situations, we may not always see that happen. And we shouldn't long for it to happen either, by the way. But we trust God. And we trust that he will be God and that we will, will simply be faithful. This psalm, I love how it ends. It ends well. It ends with praise. David praises God for his justice and he sings praises to the name of the Lord Most High. Now, there's nothing in this psalm that indicates that uh, things have been made right between him and Cush. There's nothing in this psalm that shows us that God moved and brought justice to this oppressor. Didn't matter. David praised God anyway. He knew that God was just. He knew that God loved him and that was enough. And I pray that it will be enough for you and it will be enough for me when injustice and opposition find themselves in front of us. Praise him through it because he's worthy of that praise regardless of the outcome of our perceived injustices. And remember most of all that his son took the greatest injustice and brought the greatest deliverance that could possibly have been given through it. He knows what you are going through. He is for you, not against you. So I just want you to, to live in this place where we trust God, even with uh, those accusations and those false accusations that come against us. I've got some questions for you here uh, to consider if hopefully you're doing this in a small group or uh, doing as a part of a Bible study. I, I pray these questions will challenge you and encourage you to dig deeper. Don't forget also that connected to this teaching is a Digging Deeper in the Psalms podcast, and it is available at www.beltlinechurchofchrist.org or our G. Under the Psalms tab, uh, you will see not only this video teaching, but also the podcast, Digging Deeper in the Psalms. I hope that you'll take advantage of these resources. And as always, I look forward to seeing you right back here next week as we discuss Psalm chapter 8. Take care and God bless.